it, fat boy! Raymond Mearns, Scottish legend and stand-up comedian. Welcome to the Stuart Fat Boy Show. Oh, happy to be here. I, I think I fit right in, Jason. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're in good company, by the looks Aye, of it. Good. I like the furniture. Did you, did you? I mean, this is some studio. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. I mean, you, you brought her this for your house? Uh, yeah, there's, there's <laughs> somewhere my gran's missing a couch and uh, bits oh, and yeah, pieces like gran. that. Oh, yeah, poor gran. your gran? She's 99 years old this year. Oh, my God. Really? Yeah. yeah. That's yep. amazing. <laughs> yeah, it is quite amazing, actually. She's, uh, yeah. Well, you hope you've got her genes then. Uh, yeah, yeah. Up until she was about 90, uh, unfortunately, she's got uh, dementia and that now. But oh, she God, didn't, that didn't really kind of kick in until she hit about 90. So I'll Mate. take 90. Yeah, I'll that's not 90. why you've taken advantage of that no. poor lady's condition. <laughs> And so, stealing her furniture. And this, when you take it back, she goes, I'm sure the couch was away. <laughs> and she's, she's probably nothing wrong with no, her. It's no, you. It's me it's putting her off her head. Down <laughs> Shame in you, Clancy. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I got this from her. And then these come out uh, as uh, Argos. Argos? Argos. Well, you know, they were quite cheap, I yeah, think. Yeah, they were reasonably cheap. Eight. Yeah, they're comfortable, but cheap. Yeah, that was the main thing. Did they get delivered in a van? You didn't go and stand in the line for them. I had to go to you the local Argos. Argos, yeah, and had to and carry you... these two huge boxes. It wasn't well, a, really... wasn't a thought out very carefully. I ordered them, thought I'll go down and get them, and the boxes were literally the size oh, of these no, chairs. So aye, aye. the guys looking at me going, "You've click got two of collect. these, yeah, two click chairs. and collect two chairs." <laughs> so that was that. So yeah. Uh, We've put it, I've put it together and uh, hopefully we'll get... Well, it's awesome. And what is this thing here? I don't know if you can see it in camera. This is, that... this is a Himalayan rock salt lamp. I, I, thought, it was, I thought it was your great-grandfather's earwax <laughs> that you'd collected. It's Himalayan rock salt. Yes. And where did you get that? Amazon. Is well, that right? Amazon, like pretty much all the mics and everything else. Everything. You need to watch when you're up the hill tune with stuff like that. <laughs> People will think, oh, I'm getting that. Yeah. Better that in my pipe. Exactly. That's that's. You need a big pipe to smoke that rock. But, you, uh, you you would hit it with a hammer. Yeah. I don't, know, I, I don't know anything about smoking crack. No, no, I'm I, just so. making a presumption. <laughs> uh, so you're you're a guitar player as well. You started out playing guitar, did you not? You wanted to be in bands and yeah, before yeah. comedy anyway. Oh aye. Yeah. Oh aye. I got my first guitar when I was sixteen. Nice. And I couldn't even tune it. I used to get. <laughs> it was a lovely kind of Telecaster type guitar, you know, yeah, the one yeah, Bruce yeah. Springsteen yeah. uses. And but it was a hollow body thing with a cello hole in it, right? And I couldn't tune it, and I couldn't play it, and I had this. There was this LP record. I don't know if it was Bert Whedon's playing a day. I don't know if it was, but it was like it was an American guy gone. Now, this is what the strings should sound like. Now, I have, I have no ear. I yeah, have absolutely sure. no yeah. ear at all, right? Same ear. And it's like, ding, 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 ding. And I'm kind of going, is that the same sound? And then I would keep tightening, tightening, bang. And then the string would go. And I would go into the music store in Glasgow every week and buy another set of G Gibson guitar strings. Right, okay. Because I heard they were the best. Yeah. And then that night, Friday night, ding, 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 boom. <laughs> So you weren't learning, you just kept breaking strings. Couldn't even tune the thing. I couldn't even <laughs> tune it. And what happened was, and so I, that, that was when I was 16. And um, I I kind of went through 16. Always when they start a band, 16, 17 year old, and always had the guitar. Yeah. And in fact, I, I went through three guitars. I went through on, on a third guitar. I swapped that one out for another guitar, and I swapped that for another guitar. And I still couldn't play these things. Had an amplifier and a guitar. And then I met the woman who was to become my my you know my first wife, and she went, "Oh, you got a guitar? Plays a tune? Oh, the embarrassment! I couldn't play a tune. <laughs> I just went ding ding ding, snap. That was <laughs> so. It was." <laughs> It was the embarrassment yeah. that made me learn. No, right. within within about a year, actually, I got quite good quite quickly. Okay, 
And my, my wee brother, he played keyboards. And our wee mate, he played rhythm guitar. And we had a, we, we started a wee mad band. Yeah. Now, I thought at the time we were doing well. We were certainly making progress kind of musically. But from where we'd been, no sure. much was progress. And I thought we were doing okay. But within a year, we we'd had a few songs that we'd written ourselves. Sure. And, and then about 20 years later, I heard the demo tape. And I must have been in my... <laughs> I don't know what age would have been. Maybe about 40. I'm 52 now. Yeah. So I think it was about 10, 12 years ago. I heard the old demo tape from right. that time, which the year would have been about 86. And were you doing the vocals? Oh, I. <laughs> Jason, it was the biggest pile of shite. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was, it was, it was the funniest thing I had ever heard. Yeah, my it was. We went to visit at the time my wife's cousin, and he lived down in Northampton, and he says, "I've got your old demo tape. <laughs> I've got your old demo tape." And I went, yeah. "No, I mean, yeah," <laughs> and he stuck it on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, we, we, we sat having a drink. It was utter passion. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I just remember laughing my head off, and I thought, that's just absolute shite. <laughs> and the, what we were, we were right into it, just, whoa, we were rock yeah. users. We were, whoa, we were, we were doing this, man. Yeah. We, we were happening. Aye. We had t shirts all the same, printed with the name and a band on it, and all that. And all we thought. <laughs> And what kind of music was it? Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> who was who was your inspiration? Like, well, who, I, I used to listen to like? I used to listen to Bruce Springsteen, and I wondered why I was a miserable bastard. <laughs> <laughs> wondered why I was depressed and drinking too much. <laughs> well, I listened to Bruce Springsteen and U two, and right. I, I bore no resemblance whatsoever. No. Who are actually they're both quite good. <laughs> Yeah, oh, yeah. So it was rock. It was just a guitar, yeah. a distortion pedal, and an amplifier. Right. <laughs> it was pish. It was absolute <laughs> pish. I learned to play a blues scale. I learned to play chords and change yeah. the chords quite well, mm -hmm. and got reasonably competent. And you know, and, and I kind of played maybe played regularly up until about. Oh, do, 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 do. the early 90s. Right. And kind of just never bothered. And it wasn't until 2012 when my marriage dissolved. Yeah. Which was 20 odd years later. Yeah. I went to this jam night in town with a guitar. I, 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 bought, a, I bought a guitar. Yeah. And I went to this jam night. And these guys who were playing blew me away. Yeah. And I went up and I played. Sure. Right. And it was very obvious to me where I thought I could play a wee bit how limited I was. Yeah. As a guitar player. Sure. And then have spent the last seven or eight years trying to improve, but... I think it's a bit pathetic when you're 50, sitting in your bedroom trying to learn. Because <laughs> that's, that's what you do when you're a kid. You go, yeah. oh, I'm going to go, oh, man. See, when you're 15 and you're in your bedroom playing the guitar and you're yeah. listening to a record and you're playing it again, right? And you go, oh, man, I'm so good. I'm going to get a bird guaranteed. <laughs> <laughs> Just because you're think, playing guitar. I think when you're doing that when yeah. you're 50, you're fucking dead. <laughs> yeah, that's that's not happening. No. Oh, man, I'll definitely get a bird <laughs> And I'm sure your new wife will not be happy about that. <laughs> no, I'm just saying he's a fucking nut job. <laughs> Keep it doing your crackpot. Oh, jeez. <laughs> but you see, Anne works. It's great. I know my neighbours work. So <laughs> You're just up there on your own. <laughs> just make a noise during the day, you know. Oh, Christ. Uh, it's now, pathetic. I read that you collect, you collect guitars or you got... I a do, but that's an anal thing. That's a... That's an addiction thing, isn't it? That's, I never was able, as a kid, poor, isn't it? You're poor. Sure, yeah. And when you're married, you're always broke anyway, yeah, you know, because yeah. you're weaned so this really annoying biological function known as eating. <laughs> <laughs> and they need a hoosh and clays, you know. And yeah. fucking, how needy are they? Yeah. And so, 
never get any money when you're bringing kids up. Sure. So I went a bit mad, to be honest, in the right. last 10 years, buying some really nice, nice guitars. guitars. Some... And what's the nicest guitar you've got? Um, I, I, I well, there's, there's three, four, four great guitars, three great electric guitars. There's a, the Gibson Les Paul, the Fender Stratocaster, mm -hmm. and the Fender Telecaster. Yeah. And I've got a Gibson Les Paul standard. I've got a Fender Strat American standard and a yep. Fender Telecaster American standard. I've also got a thing called a Laravie DO2, which is absolutely almost like a thing called a Martin D28, which is a brilliant acoustic guitar. Sure, yeah. So, I mean, I've got four Gibson Les Pauls and I've got about five yeah. Stratocasters and I've got... Yeah, I almost three brought... Three. No, I love the sound of the electric guitar. And you've it's the greatest sound popping ever. strings. Oh no, I, I'm telling you, I'm great. I, I still have no ear. No. But I, you, you get tuners you machine on your now, phone. Yeah. You get an app. Yeah, exactly. Called Guitar Tuner. And yeah. I, I still have no ear. I, right. But I tune it. And then I know what chords go with what scales. And I took lessons. Actually, I took lessons off this kid. And he went to some place called the Yamaha School. I thought that was a big deal. He was trained at the Yamaha school. Right. Fuck knows what a motorbike Motor cycle has got. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. but Yamaha is one of the world's biggest sure, musical yeah. instrument manufacturers. And this kid was 18. Right. Right. And this was about, I don't know, six years ago or so five years ago. I don't, I don't remember. And I'd clocked him on Gumtree. You find these kids yeah, on yeah. the you find you find these kids on the internet. Ooh, okay. <laughs> what are you up to? We'll just pause that aye, podcast now. Aye, we'll edit that bit out. <laughs> but the way you see was he says, uh, I'd, I'd be paying a guy twenty five pound a lesson, and I thought it was quite a lot. And this kid says, "Well, I, I'm seventeen quid, and you come to my house." <laughs> It's not sounding good. Here's me. Right. I know. Here's me, this middle aged guy sitting in this kid's bedroom <laughs> in the house in the suburbs. I say, So, is your parents in this? No, my parents are out. I go, oh, No, man. This is, I'm going to get to jail. Right. But he was brilliant because he showed me how, actually, he showed mm -hmm. me how to learn the modes. There's right. pentatonic scales and there's the seven modes that you need for soloing which right. is the major modes, and he showed me how to play them because I'd been paying this other guy 25 quid an hour and I couldn't get my heater in it. Right. And this kid showed me like that, how to do it. I went, connected. boom. I went, you're good. a genius. It's a shame he didn't sell out a job. <laughs> I only went back for one mere lesson. But i got to be honest, by that time I was electronically tagged. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I, he took out an restraining order against me. <laughs> Well, my dad, he played, uh, he taught me how to play guitar as well, because um, he played in the band in the 70s and that. Mm. And uh, he's got, I, I was going to bring it down tonight, but I, I just didn't have time. But uh, he's got a, uh, I think it's like a 1970-something uh, uh, Gibson Les Paul Deluxe Special. It's got oh, the that's, that's the one with the wee mini pickups. If, if it's a deluxe, it's a deluxe. It's the one with the wee mini humbucker pickups because I've got a yeah. deluxe as well. But yeah. mine is a twenty fifteen, and uh, they growl, man. They yeah. are, and they they were big in the seventies, early seventies. Yeah. Right. Yeah, he's got one of them. Um, it's sun, but I think they call it sunburst. Ah, a heritage cherry yeah. sunburst. That's right. Uh, and then he's got another one as well. I think it's a, a Fender Telecaster. I think one. Um, but there's something unique about it. It'll be a, maybe a thin line Telecaster or a Telecaster Custom 72. Yeah, I can't remember. I'll have to ask him what it was. Um, yeah, so you're... Now, the last time I saw you was probably at the Edinburgh Fringe um, doing your show there. I think that was the last did time I saw you. Did you come to the show, did you? I came to the show, yeah. I just stayed at the back and uh, and then when you were... I didn't want to bother you after it, but uh, that was your confessions of a... Confessions of a control freak. That's what That's the right. show was called, right? Yeah. But I'm not so sure. Uh, dude, we, we, we toured it. I toured it last year. That's right. And it was great, actually. Got some brilliant audiences in a few wee theatres. Studio spaces. Sure, yeah. about, And it was brilliant. And uh, the, only one, the only time it was the very last show in Falkirk where there's women in her... I don't know if it was her father or 
certainly back guys a little enough. She went, where's all the stuff about the control freakery? And I got the feeling they were both kind of control freaks. <laughs> and I went, it's just a title. Yeah. It's like the time I remember he, the, Michael Redmond did a show called And Granny's Up in the Roof Rack Again. <laughs> that was what his show was called. I remember going to see it at the Fringe years ago, years ago, and then he got to the end of the show where he danced on a cabbage and destroyed a cabbage. And <laughs> It was very artistically stimulating. Yeah. But Mike was a funny, funny, a yeah. great comedian. And this American leader went, hey there, what, what's about the, where's the story about your grandma up on the roof? I went, <laughs> it's just a fucking title. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's going to be about a fucking theme. Yeah. yeah. You know, we're only comedians, we're not fucking philosophers, you know what I mean? No. And fuck, if you need life advice from me, you're in trouble. Yeah, I saw a couple of shows at the Fringe, and uh, most the ones that I enjoyed most were where the guys just kept telling jokes. There was a couple that I went in, and suddenly 20 minutes of the end, they were just so serious. And I was like, what's going on here? It stopped being funny. Yeah. It was like they were trying to squeeze some sort of message uh, in. I know. And I was like, I know, ah, yeah. it's not working. You know, I'd prefer to just hear your tell jokes. I think it depends if it works. I, I, see, I fucked the final. I'm not a clue. I think people want, to, I think they think if, if we do 40 minutes of this and do this and we have a narrative arc and then sure. at the end there's the, Some you know, the, 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 the homecoming and the bringing back together and what this meant and, you know, you could, if, if, if you're doing it in a formulaic way and becoming preoccupied with trying to create some sort of effect of winning an award, that's so absolute bollocks. Do you know what? See if you're on stage doing comedy, just tell the fucking truth. Don't for me anyway. I I I think what I always strive for, and I'd never accomplish it. But I don't think is I just try and give them a bit of me and show everybody how mental I'm and how ridiculous I'm. <laughs> I've been a rip roaring arse in myself <laughs> in my life, and they kind of go. Ah, uh, so it's okay to be a fucking maniac. Sure. You know what I mean? You're just yeah, kind of giving people permission. <laughs> To live with ourselves, to yeah. live with our flaws, you know? Sure. <laughs> but to, to be some fucking guru, <laughs> that's a lot of shit. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if I could do that. A oh, fucking guru. <laughs> to fucking... Comedy guru. Yeah, I, I don't get that. I, I, it's a bit... It's contrived, and it's... Uh, and it's... To me, it's no true. Yeah. It's bollocks, isn't it? It's, I don't think they really believe it. I think if you're up there and you're banging on about something and you really feel it, people will feel it. I think yeah. You, you communicate that kind of idea and you go... If you yeah, they notice you believe, sincerity. I think so. I yeah. think so. People I, can tell when you're no sincere. That's right. You know? But I, I think, funnily enough, I think... I don't know. I, I think we seem to live in a world full of fucking phonies. But I still believe people are... Absolute suckers for the truth, or yeah, because yeah, you kind of know it when you hear it, and you and it's kind of refreshing sometimes, yeah. Because I know when I hear it, I go, Thank God, somebody's not talking a load of fucking bullshit, <laughs> you know what I mean? That they've read in the fucking Guardian or something, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Sure, I don't know. I what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just saying the last time I saw you, you and you were doing your show at the fringe, but I uh, confess you of a control free, I don't know what the fuck it was. <laughs> It was just a collection of anecdotes. I mean, you saw yeah, the show. that's right, yeah. It was about me going to Australia and being a, basically making an, an arse of myself. How, How long was, were you in Australia for? Well, f oh, five weeks doing the Perth weeks, Fringe didn't... last year. Okay. And what else was the show about? It was a thing about Love Island and all that. Yeah, yeah, the piles of stuff. And... and... I remember all the Australian stuff. Cause ah, I, I that's what that was lovely. I mean, that was I kinda, a good thing. I kind of made a lot of that up when I was out there. I tell you what was interesting. When I went to Australia, I had to do gigs. What happens is when you go to Australia, Alan, Alan Anderson, yeah, who's yeah. a well-known Scottish promoter, he was great. He took me out and he gave me a solo show and it was great. And I made money. It was sure. really good. Well, I made fucking five grand and drank six, right? Which is <laughs> <laughs> mental. But... He was really good. He was really, honestly, yeah. he was helpful. But what he does, he works you to death. Yeah. You know, as your solo show, but you'll do five gigs a night for no money. Right. Or no alarm. Sure. <laughs> and you get worked to fucking death. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but you go, fair enough. But what you go to do, you, you, you're in front of Australian audiences. Mm -hmm. You better connect to them. Yeah. And how you do that, 
I think it would have been how I did it. Sure. Was I need to tell them about what I know about their country or how I see it through my mad, you know, sure. filter. And you, I kind of started kind of giving that back to them. And I kind of, some of it was some lovely material about the most poisonous thing in Australia. Yeah, that's right. And the words they use. And that's it, some of it, and, and it, I got a 15 minute routine just out of that, which yeah. to me was, yeah, was great. Yeah, that was that's really fun. good. And, and you know, fear is a great motivator in yeah. comedy. It's honestly, comedy is absolutely sink or swim. <laughs> <laughs> it is sink or swim, yeah. Do or die. <laughs> Fucking and do I've, or die. Absolutely do or die. Yeah. <laughs> and you die. And I've died, I, uh, I can assure you. Uh, that. Yeah, definitely. So, was there any... you done the Perth Comedy Festival, you said. Is that right? Perth, uh, Perth Australia. Perth, Perth Australia. Fringe World, yes. Yeah. Uh, is that the first time you've done it? I've done that one. I've, I've done Melbourne in 2015. I've done okay. the Melbourne Festival. And... Couldn't get anybody into the show there. It was just location and just very difficult for me. I was, I was out every day flying and trying to drum sure. up an audience. And the biggest audience I got was 11. Right. But, I, you know, I just... I mean, and The thing about that was I did well there in terms of making some money from other gigs. Right. Because the promoter I went out with that time was Dan Willis. Right. Who... Pays a lot better. Sure. <laughs> He's really good. <laughs> well, money talks. He pays a lot better. <laughs> and if it wasn't for Dan working me to death and yeah. paying me half decent, then that would have been a real murder gig. But I, I abandoned my solo show after two weeks. I stress and I started to lose my voice. And Annie came out. Thank God, Annie yeah. came out uh, for the last two weeks. <laughs> and the two just had a wee mad holiday and it was it was lovely it was oh, yeah. really really good I love Australia yeah I've never been oh see if I was minty I'd, I'd live there Annie really? says no I'm going to Florida fuck you <laughs> <laughs> I'm off for too many creepy crawlies <laughs> well <laughs> I tell you Florida's full of creepy crawlies as well Aye, but you what? can see them coming <laughs> alligators and, alligators yeah, and you can hear rattlesnakes yeah, it's true. You get a wee bit of a signal, but aye, uh, aye. yeah, they're it's pretty tropical there still. They've got a lot of Florida. Tropical. Yeah, it's oh well, we're, we're off. We're off to Disney World in four weeks. Oh, good, cool. Well, four weeks for this. I don't know when this is going out, right? Yeah, but well, hopefully soon. Maybe six <laughs> weeks. I have no idea. We're away to Florida shortly. Okay. In fact, see by the time you hear this, I'll be in Florida. You that's <laughs> possibility of that happening. Yeah, we'll wait and see. What well, am I saying here and point to the camera? See by the time you see this. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he's so, great. He'll laugh at anything. <laughs> <laughs> the yeah. So the I read in an article. Uh, I went and done some research on you, and uh, you you do stand up comedy. You started out doing. They said you started out doing guitar sketches, uh, sort of sketches and guitar song singing and that before you got into comedy. Is that right? Right. Well. I maybe got that How, right. Well, what happened was, for me, um, at uni, when I went to university, I did the university theatre company thing. Right. And I loved that. That was amazing. So I thought, I want to be an actor. Now, by the time I got to university, I could play a wee bit. But I used to go to parties with my guitar and sing a few songs and crack jokes. And, and it was all old... Conley routines and Hector Nicol routines yep. and mix of other stuff. And then you you start to weave in your own anecdotes. Something happened to somebody. And and by about 94, my, again, my wife at the time, she says, uh, you're funny, people would pay for that, you know. Mm. I went and did an open spot and I got paid on my second and my third gig. No, that doesn't happen, no. No, no. But in 1994, I did my first gig. I got a second gig where I got paid 20 quid, and I got a third gig where they gave me 30 quid. Now, to me, that was yeah amazing. I mean, I was... I was in fact, I wasn't working at the time. I was... I was recovering from... Uh, I was born with a hole in my heart and I'd open heart surgery in the right. 1993. Yeah. So I, I was on... I was on the invalidity. I was on the incapacity. <laughs> I was screwing the door. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. No. 
<laughs> uh, well, luckily, if we I'm didn't. supposed to be unfit for work and I'm out <laughs> talking shite for money. You so, got to make them pay the bills. Oh, okay. And then you just, that was it. That's how you fell into comedy and just continued that's it. on. That's it. That's what happened. And you hang about the comedy club. You get to know other comedians. Sure. You just try and be yourself, I suppose. Yeah. As beneficial or as much a hindrance that is to your career. And and it's just hanging about comedy clubs. For me, it was just going to the, every Wednesday. It was the comedy cell in Glasgow. Ed Byrne started it, then he went to London. And Ford Kiernan and John Paul Leach took it over. And that was where I met Bruce Morton and Fred McCauley and yep. Parrot and Stu Who and Ian Cognito and Dave Gorman. Uh, yeah. So many. Sean Mio. Great, great, great comedians. Just yeah. awesome comics. And I'd hang about and then they would go, and I would always be in, I'd just come in. Sure. And they go, do you want to do five minutes? Do you want to do five minutes? Oh, I, I, all the time. Just wanted to be there. Yeah. In fact, when Wednesday would come around, I'd be like a caged animal in the flat. <laughs> and the wife would go, why don't you just go out? And I'd go yeah. on the bus. I never drove in the days. I'd go on the bus into town and go to the comedy club. I mean, I even missed the European Cup final. That's how... How much you wanted to be aye, on the stage. didn't bother me. You know, just... Was there a big crowd that night? At the European Cup? Ah, <laughs> oh, it was just a big game, aye. <laughs> it was always busy. It always seemed busy. It was only a wee tiny, tiny space. Yeah. I'll bet there wasn't any more than... 40, 50 people in the room. Yeah. But to me, it was just... Yeah, huge crowd. Yes, this is the place. This is, I don't want to be anywhere else. This is, yeah. you know, I don't know. This is it. This, you, you have purpose in there. You, sure. You're doing something you really, really kind of want to do. Yeah. See, ever since I, ever since I kind of had done the acting thing, you know, the, the, the stage stuff, I thought, I want to be an actor. Yeah. I said, well, I want to, I want to do this. I thought I was going to be a guitar player. Right. Or an actor. The last thing I ever thought I would be, in fact, was a comedian. They make money as a comedian. I, I never... That, that To me, that wasn't that obvious. And I found that just... Actors are mental musicians, comedians, these crazy people... Sure. ...who live in another world. Yeah. For the one you're used to, you, you, you know... You just finished uni and you're working in an office and working in an oil and I was working in an oil industry project for before that for uh, uh, wait, how long was it? Two two and a half years. Right. And it was all these guys working in oil business. You know these mental, crazy, beautiful, stimulating people who right. were actors and yeah. dreamers like me. Yeah. I'm a dreamer. I'm a dreamy sure. dreamer. I'm. A, I was always dead immature. I, I look back and thank God you don't, you're not aware of it at the time. But I, I, I look back at myself and I go, God, did you ever manage? <laughs> <laughs> How did you survive? <laughs> yeah. You do, you know. You just got to forgive yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not so sure most other people have. No? What do you, what do you mean by that? Uh, I was fucking mental. <laughs> Maybe their memory. Is it what you don't know? Maybe their memory of me is to go, huh? Oh, fucking crackpot. You know what I mean? I can't change it. I, if no. I offended you, I'm really sorry. Ah, it's a, I'm sure you did okay. <laughs> <laughs> did, uh, now, you spoke about films as well. How many films have you been oh, in? Fucking hundreds, loads. I don't know. I think I've made about. Between television films, short films, and feature films that come out in the cinema, I maybe something about 20. You need to go to my Spotlight CV. So if you go to RaymondBurns.com right. and you go on CV, you'll get a link to Spotlight, which is the actor's database, sure, yeah, yeah. which every serious actor <laughs> serious actor <laughs> has got to be on. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you'll see them all listed. Yeah, okay. Now, 
I know you've done, uh, you worked with Ken Loach. Twice. That's, that's an amazing accomplishment. It's been early on I as never, well. I, I never done it. I mean, how it happened was, I had actually made a film in 1998, a wee short film called Home, where my brother and I played these two blind twins who and, oh, wanted to keep... Her mother died in the piece in the house, and the officer came round, right. and we thought, he's going to fuck us out of the house and put us in the blind asylum or something. Yeah, yeah. So we're trying everything possible to waylay him and soft soap him, and, and then he lets us stay in the house. Well, I didn't mind. The thing is, it won a BAFTA, wow. right? It won a BAFTA, the BAFTAs, the big BAFTAs, not yeah. the Scottish BAFTAs, it no. won a big BAFTA. <laughs> Best short film in 1999. And I've got to tell you something about it. We did it, and we got paid okay for it. It was nice, it was a good experience. I remember watching the film in the Glasgow Film Theatre with the thing called the cast and crew screening, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember looking at myself and just going, oh, being just horrified at me, just seeing me. Yeah, and hard to watch. Oh, aye, aye. Who's that big, fat, twitchy so-and-so, right? And I kind of thought, I'm not very good at this. I, 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 honestly, sure. that's how I felt at the time. And 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 I, I thought, I'm never going to act again. I don't know, I'm, I'm a good actor. By By this time... I would actually, this was 98. Right. I was I was working, I was still working, but I was doing well at comedy. I was working pretty much all the time. Right. And I did significant second income from it. So I was doing my comedy thing. And I thought, I didn't really need to act. So I wasn't too bothered. So I never did. I, I never, I mean, I never chased this. How we got, I got, I got it, I got the job because my car broke down and I, I say to my brother, Lenny's your motor, and he, I say, I need to go up a tune tonight to do a gig, mine's broke down. And my brother says, can I come with you? Now, my brother and I look like identical twins. Oh, really? Although we were, we're no twins. He's a year older than me. And so the two is went to this gig, and this director clocked us, <laughs> like the two big hairy monsters that carry on screaming. <laughs> and, went, oh, I'm, and she was looking for these twins. Yeah. For this film, so that's how we go there. I never okay. even, I never even went looking was for any of this. Or anything, I never was just, wasn't there looking no. for any of this. She asked us to kind of come in and audition. It wasn't an audition. We just the two of us sat in chairs like this. They were in front of us, and we just started talking and they were rolling about laughing all the daft sure. stories. So we did that, but so I never chased it. Right? Yeah, that was interesting. Two thousand and three came along. And the lady who was the casting director on A Fond Kiss, which was the first film I did for Ken Loach, was being shot in Glasgow, 2003. She had previously worked as a bartender in a place called Flanagan's and Largs. And what happened was, I used to go there every Sunday and just, it was a tough, tough gig. Yeah, It was yeah. very, one week you'd get 30 people and next week you get three people and then the following week, and it just... But it was one of the gigs, I did it every week, and I enjoyed it, it was my thing, but never felt it was really going anywhere. But sure. she's working behind the bar, and I think that went kind of by the way of maybe the end of 2001. 2003 comes along, Ken Loach says to Carly, who's now the casting director, Sure. She says, give me a big fat comedian that tells it <laughs> like it is. She went, so she phoned Flanagan's and went, where was that big guy? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. He used to come in every Sunday. <laughs> and say the most awful things. <laughs> <laughs> and he went, fuck no, it's Raymond something. I Is he still know. fat? <laughs> <laughs> and so she phoned the Stan Comedy Club and said, I'm looking for a big fat fella called Raymond who swears a lot. She went, that's Raymond fucking Merns, isn't it? Yeah. He's the man. And that's, that's how that happened. I swear to God. Yeah. And so Eva from the Stan Comedy Club phoned me and says, some lady's looking for you. That's her number. Do you have a phone? So I phones her up and says, you looking for me? And she went, aye, do you want to come meet Ken Loach? I went, Ken Loach? Neighbor, I'd never fucking heard him. I'm going to be honest. Sure. I'm an ignorant cunt. Yeah. <laughs> hey, no, I had heard him. I'd heard a sure. case and all that. And I'd seen Sweet 16. And it was awesome. Met him. Met yeah. him and Paul and Carlene. And we did this wee improvisation about 
a, a neighbour's dog doing a shite in the close and my wains were tramping in it and oh. he and I and he says you've got the job and I got the job and it was awesome it was amazing oh yeah and I remember so I think I went oh no right fuck what am I going to do I don't know what I'm doing yeah right and I remember saying to Ken and I was honest about it I says look I've not acted for five years I'm I don't know if I'm any good at this. Yeah. And I remember he said to me, we kind of cut a scene and as I'm kind of walking half set, and he went, Raymond, I can't kind of believe you've not acted for five years. You're a natural. Camera loves you, and I'm going, oh. Well, if anybody's knows, it's going to be him. Sure, yeah. So I'll take that for a dollar. That's really amazing when that happens. Oh, yeah. Because then what happens is you go, you know, maybe I can do this, but. A wee bit of confidence. Yeah, but, but but that's when the vibe changes because then you're then you're doing it because you think you can do it. So I spent the next three years trying to do whatever I could, just actory wise and doing just any wee job, you sure. know short films and it was amazing, you know, you would yeah. you you learn actually that you go got to learn the lines. You've yeah. absolutely got to 100% learn every line. Yeah. And then the magic starts to happen. That's what... Because the guy that's written it, he's written... Your your character's got to get from there to there. Yeah. And he gets you there. You don't... You're just a, an actor. You're yeah. You're just saying the words. The vehicle. And listen to the other guy. And trying to make sense of what the guy's written and try and make it as... Sure true as you can and uh, so for the next few years I did and I, I, I learned a lot and then in 2006 Ken Lodge God bless him what a man amazing gave me another job right and he flew me down to London and I'm playing this bartender and then the first day so I, I thought I was going to just get cut out of the film because of this because I just he went oh, cut cut Raymond what are you doing he says uh, I'm acting, Ken, since I was last week. I've learned to act. He's going, oh, no. I don't want you to act. I want you to be you. And I went, oh, no. Oh, no. The anxiety. <laughs> I'm going to end up in the cutting room flare here. This is going to be a fucking disaster. But you ended up in the, the final cut. I did end up in the final cut. I honestly, I... You... Other than learning the lines and trying to get the intention sure and by that my understanding is is like is understanding what how's the line delivered it's like a good example is something like uh, like to be or not to be from hamlet sure when kids don't know what it is they go to be or not to be is like a call to arms it's not yeah. it's a meditation on suicide so it's yeah. kind of a, to be or not to be it's like you're, you're so that you know, that's the sort of idea. I I don't know any about Shakespeare anyway, but I kind of go, what's this guy trying to do here? Is he, you know, what what does this piece of thing here? What, what does it say about this guy? Who is the guy? How's he saying this, and why is he saying this? And you know what? See if you're doing it wrong, the director will go. You're That's doing right. That right. Yeah. And you go, thank fuck for that. Yeah. Well, Somebody doing knows what job. they're doing. Exactly. So I just know the lines. That's so I do. I, sure. And in filmmaking, I, a lot of people don't really realize this. It's such a collaborative yeah. thing. You've got amazing people that make the set. Yeah. Create the, the art directors and mm -hmm. set designers and sparkies and. Yep. And joiners and carpenters and they build things and then they light it and the yeah. camera guy look he does his thing and I don't know I I don't know and and the runners all sort you and some people feed you and people get you there and it's, actors are so oh yeah so blessed that they they have to just sit and you know just learn your fucking lines look yeah. at the work they're all putting in yeah. And everybody pulls it all together, and the sound guy listens to your voice, and mm -hmm. they all, and then the editor, and then they color it, and it, it's amazing. You're you're only a wee. It's the spec in it. The sad thing is, it's the actors that get all the money and the glory. Sure. And the directors as well, maybe, yeah. maybe to a lesser extent, the writers. But 
the jobs people like continuity yeah people do and costume people and oh, yeah it's awesome yeah but, i remember seeing um i can't remember the actor's name but he was uh he was in lord of the rings and he played the the king of rohan and as bernard hill bernard hill that's ah, right yours are huge yeah and uh, he was speaking about Lord of the Rings and he was saying I was preparing and, you know, every day I was trying to be better, you know, when I was on set. And uh, he said the moment that you suddenly sort of captured the, the sort of the whole essence of the film was when they brought his armour to him and he was put, a way to put it on and he noticed in the inside, because it was kind of like a leather vest thing he was going to wear, in the inside, because it was like a solid stiff leather, the guy had, the guy who obviously made it, had inscribed the, a horse's head in the inside. It's just this, now nobody's going to see it, but the guy just, obviously the the, the Rohan people were the horse people. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And this guy had just, you know, you could probably just imagine this guy. Thought, There's no, no need there. for that level There's no of need, detail. But he put it in there and he thought, if that guy's doing that, it's just, love and passion. There's it's passion beautiful. there. Ah. And he says that just made him want to be even better. He said, that person knows what this is all about. You know? Absolutely, and it, and you, and you feel a fraud actually. Is that yeah? Is that when you kind of you kind of get? What do they call it imposter syndrome. <laughs> is that what they call it? They call it imposter syndrome, <clears throat> and you're just, you're just looking at the other guy, and you're saying your lines and going, oh, "I'm fucking shit." <laughs> 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 well, I'm sure you're not. You couldn't have done all these uh, films without it. I, I think a... some people see something in me. Um, I'm a type. I'm not classically handsome. Thankfully, the acting profession is full of people who are classically handsome. Yeah. I think we... We're we a character weird, actor. We weird-looking guys like me. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, we're few and far between. But that's what makes you unique as well, then, because that's what they're looking for. It's a character. God help them if they're looking for me, but I, <laughs> I, and, and you know, I, I, I hope they they look for me a lot more. I'm easy to find. <laughs> Ravenmans dot com cv. There's there's a, a quick punch for his website there. So, um, I had a similar thing as well. Uh, like you said, the barmaid scene you at one point, and then suddenly she's at a different job. Um, I had a thing with uh, my first short film that I made, and it was called Dogmen, and. I sent it out to all these different festivals, trying to get it into it. It wasn't really a great film overall. Uh, I put a lot of time and effort in it, but it wasn't the greatest. But I had sent it to uh, Sundance, because, you know, oh, the so, greatest uh, film so festival, brilliant. and I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to get it into Sundance, you know, delusional. And about maybe six months later, this uh, I get this email through, and this lady had been working at the Sundance Film Festival. The film came through, and she was a viewer, basically. So she would chuck the disc and watch it and go, nah, it's no use. Or not, it's not going to be, you know, I didn't have to tick the boxes for getting aye, into the aye. festival. But she kept a hold of my film because she said she just something about it she liked. Right, that's she, brilliant. She then gets a job uh, working as a sort of, kind of, I guess, like a low-level creative exec at NBC television wow and she emails me saying i'm now working here i saw your film at, as a viewer at sundance i think it would make a great tv show wow and i'm like oh so i email her back and i'm and she's asking you know permission to start you know looking at stuff and i said to her, i said well hey do whatever you want that that sounds amazing to me um but i says do you honestly think because the film was called dog men and it was about dog fighting and yeah, I said, yeah. do, you, do you honestly think an uh, NBC audience want to watch a weekly TV show about dog fighting? And she says, well, I, we're, we're thinking, you know, the same sort of grounds as HBO's Sopranos and, you know, we're, we're looking yeah, for something they, gritty. Yeah, they've got a lot license for you know. mental stuff like that. Now, this was back around about 2006. And I thought, okay, fair enough. So she ran off with it. Uh, and for about six weeks, it was emails back and forward, asking questions about characters and bits and pieces. And I was just blagging the whole thing because I'd written this sort of four or five minute short. Uh -huh. I never really thought much more beyond that. Uh, so I, so I'd given them, oh, well, the whole thing, would, if it was going to be set in America, it should be set in Boston. 
and uh, oh why you know and Southie uh, yeah Southie crazy. that sort of aye. yeah crazy uh, Irish descent gangster Gangsters. guys um, and it should be about a, a father who's just got out of prison and he was the original sort of dog trainer um, because that's what the that's what the, the use in old Victorian times they had people and they called them their dog men and they right. actually trained the dogs to fight when dog wow. fighting was legal right and so all the rich people, they would go to dog fights and they had their own dog man. And that's why wow. I made this film called Dog Men. And so I said he would be a, what they would class as a dog man. He's coming out of prison and his son is now involved in the dog fighting industry. And that's the, the dynamic. Uh, and the first dog fight of the opening scene should be happening on a subway or an L train or something in a subway car. Right. And it's going round. That was the idea. And they flipped out about it. And I got this email. Oh, we really like that. It's a great idea. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking, I'm moving to, mm, going to be moving America, to LA. Yeah. This is it. This is it. It's all happening. And bang. Suddenly she comes back and she goes, everybody loves it. But the guy goes, I think it's a great idea. I just don't think we could do dog fighting on a weekly basis at NBC. And that was the end. That was it. It was gone. And I just sort of went, oh. But it was an amazing experience, just even just doing over email yeah, and a few phone calls. You know what? I think that might still happen. I think well. that. I think the problem is that, I think it's like that thing recently which is on Don't Fuck With Cats. I think <laughs> the Netflix, yeah. we're very much in Western society, we're kind of animal lovers. Yeah. And for the general population, any sort of cruelty to dogs or cats is absolutely yeah a no no. It's yeah, boring. exactly. I mean, look at that woman that put a cat in the bin. <laughs> oh yeah, that's got, right. She nearly got well. God, the hate that was directed. Oh, towards her. that was yeah. She got it. It uh, was just yeah. It was randomly uh, just chucked it in. The I bin. think that's. I think that's a bit. I, I can see their point. Yeah. No, I I saw, it and I don't think NBC was in that kind of sphere that wasn't the type of program and they were doing it so can we do it with turkeys or something can we get <laughs> turkey men <laughs> well they do so hen i guess uh the cock fighting still mm. big in mexico cock and stuff fighting. like that but no in america cock men no cock men no <laughs> <laughs> no we can't have cocks like, every every week on a monday so no idea <laughs> what are we talking about we're talking about f filmmaking basically but it's it's i i you know it is it's awesome yeah. I, I think it's... I, I watch films all the time. I love films. I love dramatic films. I love thrillers. Mm. I love sci-fi. Mad for sci-fi. Sure. I thought the film Gravity was brilliant. Oh, it was you know Andrew Bullock. And, and Clooney. And if I, Anne and I watched it together, and I just thought it was phenomenal. Yeah, it was a great... I thought it was a great example of show, not tell. I think it was a brilliantly made film. And even though it was all kind of CGI'd, and I just thought it was still fantastic. And it finished, and Annie went, what a pile of shit. <laughs> 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 I says, oh, you just don't get this. No. Did you ever see the film Lock? Oh, we, uh, Tom Hardy. I, I haven't seen it, oh, but I keep... You could see it. it. Yeah, I've got it's a... one of the greatest films ever made. Right. It truly is magnificent. And I'm going to... And I'm... You just watch it. Okay. It'll it'll blow your mind. Okay. It's phenomenal. And you once you've seen it, you go. It, it truly yeah. is a thing of beauty. Okay. Is there any film now that obviously has made an impact on you? Any other film that's made such an impact? <clears throat> oh, where do you want to start? I remember seeing Star Wars when it was first in the pictures in seventy seven. And I remember my brother and I, my big brother and the two, is going right in the front row at the Odeon in Glasgow, going, I can't believe we're really here. Yeah. Because the queues, and there was no days, there was no multiplex cinemas, there was no, you didn't have 10 screens in the no. cinema. You had no. one picture house. And everybody, for everybody in Glasgow, right? And the queues were in the block, and there was, I don't know, two, three hundred in, and then you had yep. to wait, and another two, three hundred, and there's thousands queued up. Yeah. I was the same here when I was a kid because I mean I'm for I'm probably about ten years younger than you, but there was only two cinemas here when I was growing. Right. Up. One of them had two screens, and the other one had one screen. Oh, and that was it. You had better facilities than us. 
uh, I mean, uh, what, I know and he's disgraced now as a person, but one of my favourite films, and I think it's a pure, a genuine masterpiece of a movie, is American Beauty. Oh, we gave him space. It's a, and it's a shame he's not a very nice person. Yeah. But a, a beautiful film, a, such a well-made film, such just... Uh, Shawshank. I mean, I've done a lot of what I'd like is pretty trite, I suppose, and a bit cliched. But different films for kind of different reasons. Yeah. Silence of the Lambs. I think yeah, it's, tremendous film. There's a scene in Silence of the Lambs where you just watch, you're watching the film and it's when when Clarice Starling first visits Lecter in the, the, the loony bin and he asks her a question and he says, whatever he says, and when she says, is that right, Doctor? And you could see she's actually blushing. She's embarrassed by, that's acting, man. Yeah, to make yeah. yourself kind of like blush, I just think. Yeah, to create that emotion. never be that good. That's yeah. just, you just look at performances. Did you ever see, um, there was, I remember what you're talking, or I know what you're talking about with, uh, Michael Caine was on Parkinson's one. And uh, they asked him about that, like, you know, how do you, uh, you know, elicit these emotions and so that. And then he says, well, if I'm going to cry, I just go to this one memory. Ah. And you could see his eyes start to well up because he obviously... You, you do, you, you think in. about what would and it, make, try and make it real. And it was the first time, because I've never, and I like Michael Caine, but I never actually thought of any in... You know, the most I saw his, some of his old films in the 70s and saw him in Zulu and uh -huh, uh -huh. things like that, but I never ever thought of him as beyond anything. But then, as soon as I saw that, I thought, oh wow, he could really act. It just came out of nowhere. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Michael Caine, he, I, I, he's done some amazing things. He does some shit. Yeah, sure. But he's, he's, he's one of his best um, quotes was when he made The Swarm. The Swarm, yeah, the <laughs> in bees. In the mid 70s, he said, not my fault the bees can't act. <laughs> You said I wa I watched the the making of that. Somebody done a, a small documentary on it, and uh, Michael Caine said they asked him. They said, "Why did you do the film?" And he said, "Well, I got paid three hundred thousand money." He oh. says, "That bought my uncle's house." Oh man! And he said, "You see, what you don't understand with people from the the UK is if one of us makes it, all the rest of the family think they've made it." He says, "So I used to do films and get the money, and then I'd be." Oh, Uncle Tommy needs this, or and so, and amazing. so he bought his uncle's house with oh, that man, that'd be beautiful. in London. So uh, that's what he was. So doing. you did that if you kind of won a lottery or something. Yeah, you'd exactly. Buy all your family. Yeah, house. you'd hit, sort them out. So you that's would, what you'd he was have doing. To, aye. You know, um, Annie and I have arguments about that sort of thing. <laughs> what about? Uh, but, help? Yeah, you're getting your brother or something. But he's fucking <laughs> hopeless. Yeah, fuck that. No, we're keeping the money. I'm buying a cat and dog home. <laughs> talk so we're having an argument about money we've not even fucking won. <laughs> For I'm not talking to you now. How? <laughs> You're not giving my brother money. Well, you've not got any money in that job. <laughs> uh, well, uh, so the you spoke you spoke about acting, um, and it's obviously some a passion of yours, and you're still trying to do, hopefully still do it. You've just it's, done... it's there by the way, over it. It's kind of yeah, it's still performing. It's something I and. I kind of see it's you 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 do comedy and you I do kind of singing the musical gigs on my guitar now as well, which you know I'll, I'll never I, <laughs> fuck make a living at that. I'll have done well, sure, and everybody suddenly went deaf, <laughs> but in the the acting and all that, I see it always artistic and creative. I think to make a living. Uh, from an artistic thing, sure. to me, it's this is what that's 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 living, man. That's yeah. really to me, that's the pinnacle. Sure, to to make a living. No, pardon me, to become a gazillionaire, then oh, but yeah, but and, 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 and what money does? But that just sets you free. It just sure. means you don't need to worry. Yeah. About the basics and yeah, things. Yeah, gas bills paid. Don't yeah. Worry about that. Aye, and you know, and you don't need to worry about most people. I me, I don't know about you. I me, I, and most other people. You know, 
if 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 you had to stop working, you maybe three or four months for being in serious financial trouble. Sure, yeah. To pay all your bills. So whilst I still, I'm just I'm working for a living. I'm doing something I love. Yeah. And to me, that's amazing. But in itself, that so you 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 could be working in an office. I could be selling telephone systems, which is what my last job was. I could still be selling telephone systems doing yeah. that. But I much prefer doing comedy. Sure. Paying my bills. Yeah, to you me, can't believe you're getting paid for this. To, to me, and do you know what? Most of the people that book me can't believe it either. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. <laughs> now, you've just, you, this, or just last year there, you were involved with something with Channel 4. A film, I shot a film called Limbo in the Western Isles in Benbecula. And the it's called Limbo, and it's a Channel Four uh, production. It'll be out at some point in twenty twenty because okay. I met the director at the Baftas. Oh, he went Raymond. I went Ben. How you doing? I says that's good. That's lucky. We'll be here next year, and I won't have to pay for my table. <laughs> I'm going to be in your table, big man, because we're going to get nominated. Yeah, very good. So I, I just I only was in a couple of scenes. I only had a couple of days on it. I just play this mad fisherman who's a bit off. <laughs> uh, what happens is that the conceit of the film is that Syrian, Syrian asylum seekers are sent, they come to the UK looking for asylum, and they send them to Benbecula, okay. which is a fucking terrible idea. <laughs> right? I would never subject them to that. And the locals are all a bit... Yeah. You know what I mean? What's they're going all, on? They're all racist, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. You know... So I play one of the, so we chat like the new UEFA, yeah, where do you know if you're in here, eh? Yeah. One of these sort of yeah. things. So that was that. You had to do a voice for it and everything. And then you do the additional dialogue recording and they say, you can't understand a word you're saying. Could you do it all in Glaswegian now with received pronunciation <laughs> and try and not distort the vowels too much? All right, fair enough. <laughs> After good. being told, to, it's, it's one of the vagaries of the, they shoot it. Although the day we shot oh, the big scene, there was wind coming in off the Atlantic. We seven miles near wind. <laughs> that would sell. I, I don't some know how they. I, I, I don't uh, imagine they would have heard the thing we said. To be honest, no, no, I wouldn't have thought so. Or at least yeah. it'd be very difficult. And it was, it was difficult. It was very difficult. But I knew my lines, and I just kept doing my lines, and I just tried my best, and and I. And I was looking at Amir and talking sure. to him, and he's giving me the line. And Big Ben saying, "Could you try not to shout?" I says, "I know, but the wind's blowing, Ben. I went in and find it, and and Amir can he hear me? Sure, and I can hear him. <laughs> so it was, it was, a, it was difficult. It was very difficult. Yeah. But we well, got there, and I, well, who knows? Might not even be on it. I might not make the cut. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you will. Every time you think you're not making the cut, you seem to have made the cut, maybe. so. Uh, well, well, touch wood. Touch yeah, wood, yeah. Touch wood. So, what is what does the future hold for Raymond Merns? Comedy, film, and what, what What do you think? Do you know, it's just made it the same, really. Um, the real trick in this game, I think, is just to try and live in the moment and and do, and do your gigs and try and make an emotional connection with the audience that's in front of you. And you, it's like I said at the start of this, uh, you, you try and give them a part of you and they then hopefully pick up and identify yeah. with that, some aspect of that. In their cells, and they go, Thank God. <laughs> it's not just me, it's a mental case. Because success in life, I remember Noel Coward said success in life is the ability to overcome failure. And what happens is, as we, for some reason, I don't know, we're all supposed to be perfect or put out a veneer of perfection or respectability the, we forget I think it's, I don't know you, you're kind of not really allowed to be yourself you're you're judged a bit I think sometimes I think so aye and, and, and in order to not be judged 
you kind of conform to society, well, the sheep sort of aye, mentality. And, and you know, you buy a nice suit and get your arsehole bleached. And they were, oh, I don't know, right? And, <laughs> right, but you know what I mean? And, yeah. and to me, that's no you being true to you, I think. Yeah. By the way, I have a suit, but I've never had the other thing done. So Yeah, but, <laughs> but I think you get what I'm Yeah, I know what you mean. You have to kind of, you know, get decked out in your tin flute and get covered in your L'Oreal men expert. You know, this pish. Uh, and, you you know, your 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 salvation is through fucking consumer products, which is no. No. And I, and I think what great films they are great books or even a song you'll hear or a comedian you'll listen to reminds you of your human frailties, I think, you know, and sure. your flaws. And you go, oh, fuck, I remember that guy. He was fun. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no. And you lose yourself. And it's it's hard. It's, I, think it, I think it's really hard to go against, especially when you're bombarded with advertising everywhere and peer pressure, it's hard to stand in the face of that and go, no, do you know what? I'm just going to be me, just try and be the best version of me that I can be, but beautifully, perfectly flawed and try and be real and no be a big phony. Yeah. You read Catcher in the Rye. You're familiar about yeah. J.D. Salinger. Holden Caulfield was banging on about all these phonies. Mm-hmm. And it's just true in the 1960s. Yeah. In the United States as it is new. Yeah. I think, I think, you, you, I'm, well, we're very suggestible. I, people will start talking and I'll go, oh, I didn't know that, right? And then you'll kind of, and I'll assimilate it and then I'll hear myself saying it to somebody else. And it's bollocks. Yeah, you do. It's fucking bollocks. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. I'm, yeah, just, trying to see, I'm, trying, I'm just trying to see me erudite. I mean, I'm really I'm just a fucking moron. I've not got a clue. <laughs> <laughs> I've not got a fucking clue what I'm doing. <laughs> How did you get here? <laughs> I have no idea. Sat nav brought me. You're sat nav. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm fucking not getting here. <laughs> I was going to come on the train. All oh, right, okay. <laughs> well... The and have you got any? You've got more uh, tour dates. Where can people find out? Where aye, to see you? aye. Oh, I'm touring. You can find them at www. <laughs> Another plug. It's along the screen at the bottom. Yeah. There it is now. We'll, <laughs> uh, www.raymondhearns.com. I'll, uh, I'll thank put you links for to... editing that in. Yes, yes thanks I very will. much for that. Oh, there it's again. <laughs> I'll uh, I'll put links to everything on the the YouTube video. Brilliant! Whatnot, I so. I'm always gigging. I'm always trying to gig. You know, to be, to to be, I don't know, to make a living in it. You just need to do your best and yeah. try and always just do the best you can do in that in that moment and try and love what you're doing and bring yourself into it. And no, tell the audience you want, to, but to please the audience, but to to share with them and they can sure. go. You know what? The big man's gave us something. We we can take something away. Yeah. Even if they're still kind of laughing at me, go. He was fucking cracked. <laughs> <laughs> He's not right. <laughs> <laughs> that seems to be the theme of this. Aye. He's not right. He's. I'm not right. <laughs> but you are. You are right. I'm all right. I'm fucking. I'm. I'm all right. right. It's I'm like better the, now. <laughs> I get stopped with the police. and go. You are right. No. You are right. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, Raymond, thanks for coming. And, Jason, uh, really thank, appreciate it. Thanks. It's always it's always nice to be asked about my thoughts about things. <laughs> as, well, a, as incoherent as they are. <laughs> well, we'll uh, we'll have you back again soon. But I, I, it'll be many of the same bullshit. <laughs> I don't think I've got anything new. Uh, I might do something. Maybe something will happen. I'm, I hope it does. Touch wood. Have a good time. Thanks, thanks very much. Jason, thank thanks, Jason. Thanks for you. having us. Bye bye. Pleasure. Shoot it! Fat boy!